to work and prepare. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and take a look at our Bell work for today then. We know that we can find the domain of a function when given a rule by considering the possible x values, right? The allowable x values that we could plug into my function rule uh, and not break any math rules. As you look at this function definition, f is given by 1 over 2x plus 6, what might you be concerned with, right? What, what do you have to be on the lookout for given that definition? Matab? A zero in the denominator. A zero in the denominator. Excellent. And so if we have a fraction in our function definition, we want to make sure that we're not allowing x values that when substituted in would create a zero in the bottom of the fraction. So I can't have a quantity that equals zero, right, in the bottom of a fraction. So what's the easiest way to find that? I'll take my quantity, whatever it may be, in this case 2x plus 6, and I'll set it equal to 0 and see what x values would make a 0 on the bottom of the fraction. And after finding those, I can pull them out of the domain. I'll say that x can't equal those problematic x values. So we can solve this. So it looks like when x equals negative 3, when x equals negative 3, then I would have a 0 on the bottom of the fraction. I plugged a negative 3 in here and worked it out. I get 2 times negative 3 is negative 6 plus 6 is 0, and I can't have that. So x can be anything else, right? But it can be negative 3. How do I tell the reader that? I'll say the set of all x values such that x doesn't equal negative 3. And raise your hand if you already had that. Who had all x's except for x can't equal negative 3. Way to go, you guys. Good job. Thanks, hands down. How would I evaluate f of negative 1? Easy cheesy. I'll go to my function rule. My function rule that accepts input values. Except everywhere I see an x in my function rule for input. I'm not going to put x. What am I going to put, Cameron? Negative 1. Negative 1, thank you, and then we'll work it on the inside out. I get 2 times negative 1 is negative 2 plus 6. Negative 2 plus 6 is a positive 4 on bottom, so I get 1 over 4. Please raise your hand if you already had 1 fourth. You had 1 fourth? Thanks, hands down. You guys are rock solid to the top. I know you're going to do great. Let's go ahead and take a look at our final one then. We want to solve for n. We tried to make one that was pretty complicated with lots of lots of forward uh, steps and reverse undo to get solving steps. And so let's go ahead and check the requirements for our strategy. We need a single, right, our, our variable occurring on one side and outside of the denominator. So we can't be in the denominator in order to use our strategy. It looks like we're okay. So I'll go ahead and cover up the side of the equation that does not contain the variable I want to solve for, and list my forward steps. If I plug in a variable value for n and evaluate it, the first thing I would do is square it. So my first forward step would be squaring, followed by multiplication by q, I'm sorry, by k, rather, and then dividing by q. Bless you. So I'll go ahead and reverse and undo these to get my solving steps. If the last thing I did was divide by q, the first thing I'll do to solve is multiply by q. What undoes timesing by k, All right, Olivia? Um, dividing by k. Dividing by k, thank you. And then what does undoes squaring, right? What undoes squaring? Luke? Square root. Absolutely. Just make sure that when we're undoing a squaring, right, a squaring, that's my little reminder that I could be on the lookout for two different answers. So what do I have to include on my root, Luke? Uh, Positive. Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you. Let's go ahead and apply those solving steps now in order. So my first solving step, multiply by q. So we'll times both sides by q. Notice on the left-hand side that we have a quantity. That's quantity g minus w. And so I need to make sure that I either include parentheses or multiply the q through to everybody. It's not just q times g and then still minus w. It's q times quantity g minus w, right? You may distribute that if you like. I'm not going to. I'm going to leave it as q times g minus w equals m squared k. Next, I'll go on to divide by k. Both sides, thank you for showing that. Bam, boom. And I get q times quantity g minus w all over k. 
equals m squared and we're close, now I just have to undo the squaring by considering the positive and negative square root. So we'll go ahead and say that m equals the positive and negative square root of, oh goodness, q times quantity g minus w close quantity all over k close radical. Whew. Take a break, pause. <coughs> Survey the room. I'm dying to know. Did anybody else get to the final answer? Did anybody get the plus or minus? The plus or minus? Yes! I've got a great feeling about today's quiz. I think you guys are going to do great, particularly because this is harder. This is probably harder than any of the solving equations that you'll have on your quiz. I wanted to make sure that you were well warmed up so you could do your very best. And so this is a little bit of beyond um, what you might have to do on your quiz, but not by much, right? You'll have a couple, two tricky ones with variables, I think. Awesome. What questions do you guys have in your bell work before we go on? Okay, we did not have a reading question uh, on assignment number six, and so everybody, your maximum score in Infinite Campus is going to be four. Nobody should have a five on their Infinite Campus score for today's assignment number six if we check it. So give yourself credit for those you completed out of 26, please. Out of 26. Divide, enter, multiply by four. And then round your final answer to the nearest half point zero to four. Nobody should have a five today because there's no reading questions associated with our assignment number six. So this is assignment six that we're checking. Today's assignment will be linear functions activity, that worksheet, that'll be number seven. So this is assignment number six. What questions do you have about the infinite canvas score today? Nobody should have a five. Okay. So make sure that you have your name then, your name first and last. 3A, number six, if you have a piece of graph paper, like you use a graph, piece of graph paper, multiple pages, please staple that together, right, on the back. And so I want to have your bookwork on front and the graph paper, extra pages attached on back. If you need to borrow a stapler, there's one on the front desk. There's also one on the side activity table, but make sure you have that stapled now, please. And careful with the microphone if you come over here. Don't bump the microphone. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we'll continue now with our checking. And so, we can find an inverse in the most general sense by switching the coordinates in each point. We can switch the x with the y. And number three, we can get the inverse by doing just that, switching the x and y's in each order pair. The graph is shown in B, and it ends up being a linear function. So you can get its equation for letter D by <coughs> counting out the slope between subsequent points, and then determining the y-intercept by looking at the graph, 0, comma, negative 1. So in D, f of x is given by 2x minus 1. To get the inverse equation, you could then rewrite with x's and y's. Interchange the x and y, solve for the new y, and call it f inverse of x, or in this case, g of x, just like we did in class, that four-step process. So number three took everything we did last class and put it into a single question. That was pretty cool. Awesome. They're mirror images of one another when reflected about the line y equals x. And four, the domain's all the x's and the range is the y's and vice versa. And the graph of the inverse of any relation is the mirror image when reflected about the line y equals x. 6, y is x over 3. 7, y is 5x plus 10. 8, x is y squared when I switch them. B is multiple answers. Nine, the inverse of Q is not a function because the graph of Q failed the horizontal line test. Ten, yes, the graph passes the horizontal line test, guaranteeing that its inverse will be a function. Eleven, no, the graph of the function doesn't pass the horizontal line test. Twelve, no, the graph of the function doesn't pass the horizontal line test. And then thirteen, well, that would be the having function, right? What would undo doubling? Having, right? I take half of something would undo doubling it. Number 14, you can make up your own and then just reverse the coordinates. Fifteen, there's A and C, graph together. 
B, it looks like Y equals X minus 7 all over 3. D, yes. The graph of the function satisfies the vertical line test. E, the slope is the inverse, the inverse of the original slope 3. What's the inverse of 3? One third. Bless you. One third. Second section, the inverse of f is read f inverse. It has a little negative 1. 3, yes, the composition results in x both ways. 4, h inverse of x is given by x minus 7 all over 5. b, the composition results in x. 5a, x plus 15. a inverse is x minus 15. Subtracting 15 is the opposite of adding 15. And d is 63. 6, yes, f inverse is x over 21. 7, no. An equation for the inverse would be x equals 21, and that's a vertical line. It does not pass the vertical line test and doesn't represent a function. 8 is x. 10m inverse is given by 5 times x. That would be multiplying by 5, the inverse operation for division by 5. 16y is 1 over x. What we'll see today is our reciprocal function. 17y is 2x minus 14. 19f, the inverse of the inverse, would get us right back to the original. It's pretty sweet. Twenty. That was an interesting question. So it had the y equals x squared graph, right? The y equals x squared graph. When you invert the position of x and y, we saw that the same x value, and the same x value, is paired with multiple outputs, and so nine would be paired with three and negative three, and that's not okay. However, if we restricted the domain to include only positive inputs and positive outputs. Then we could generate inverse functions. G inverse would be the positive root x, and G inverse would be negative root x, depending upon which half, which arm of the problem you were looking at. As you're finishing up, go ahead and give yourself an accuracy fraction out of 26 about how well did you did on the top front page and circle that. Make sure your infinite canvas score is box 0 to 4. Nobody should have a 5. Make sure that your heading, name, first and last, 3A, and number 6 are clearly labeled. And then I know we're out of order. That's fine. We're going to go ahead and pass from back to the front in the super column that you're in. But make sure front rowers that they're facing the same direction because that will still help a lot. So once again, front rowers, make sure they're facing the same direction, please. Thank you. Very good with number six. We did it, number six. Awesome. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Today we're going to introduce several function families into our basic library of functions. And throughout the course of the year, we're going to be returning to several of these in more detail. In fact, unit six is all about the squaring function. An entire unit is dealing with quadratic functions, which come from the squaring function. And so what we're going to do today is introduce those on our green sheet. If everyone could please find your function family's green sheet. We're going to go through it and get the equation, several key ordered pairs on each graph. We'll make a picture, and then we'll state some key characteristics along with each function's domain and range. And so that's our goal for the first half of class. Then, second half of class, we'll be taking your quiz. Okay, when you're done, with, you're allowed to use a calculator on the quiz. When you're done, you'll bring it and you'll put it face down on the front chair closest to the whiteboard. I'll put it up here with the label. And then you're going to work on your assignment number seven. It's just that linear functions um, worksheet that you picked up on your way in. There's no book work tonight and no reading questions. So you'll have a nice weekend, right, where you don't have to lug your advanced algebra book home this time. We kind of got a nice little break. It's a very important activity, but it's not very long. Okay, awesome. Let's go ahead and get going then to make sure you have plenty of time on your quiz. So our first family in our in our library of function families is called the constant function. The constant function is named the constant function because 
every single y value, every single y coordinate returned by the constant function is whatever that constant k is. And so we'll say k is just some number, some value. Like 2. So it's just some number like 2. I'll say a number. If my function f of x were given by 2, then no matter what x coordinate I put in there, whether it was negative 3, negative 1, 0, or 17, right, the y coordinate returned by this function would always be the same thing. k, in this case, 2. If I were to plot all of these together on the xy coordinate plane, it would make what kind of graph? Well, it would make a horizontal line. So the constant function, y equals k, or f of x equals k, important characteristic, it's a horizontal line. The domain of the constant function is all real x values. It doesn't matter what we plug in for x, we don't make a zero on the bottom of the fraction. And we don't make a negative number inside of a square root. So all real x's is my domain. However, my range is only the y value k. Right? The only y value ever produced is k. And so it would be the set of all y values such that y equals k only. That is the quite possibly the ugliest right cursive bracket I've ever seen in my life. And I apologize for having exposed each of you to it. We're all a little bit dumber as a result of seeing that. Sorry, that's my fault. So much for ACT scores plummet. Thanks. My bad. All right, let's get the next function. The next function is called the identity function. It's so named because every time I, I put an x value in, it pairs it with the same value for y. And so the identity function is given by f of x equals x. And we saw this yesterday. That's the same as y equals x, our diagonal line that cuts through the origin at a 45 degree angle. So my identity function takes input values and pairs them with output values that are exactly the same. So negative 3 would be paired with negative 3. Negative 1 would be paired with negative 1. 0, 0, 4, 4. If I connected all these ordered pairs, we get our identity function, our y equals x line that we saw yesterday when we were doing reflectional symmetry. Important characteristics, this is a linear function or a line, it has a constant rate of change. Slope is 1, and its y-intercept is 0. So constant rate of change means that no matter where you look, the y-values are increasing at a steady rate. The domain is all real x's, and range is all real y's. These will be saved on our recording and as a PDF, right? Hyperlinked on the advanced algebra Moodle for notes. And so if you don't get all the characteristics, you guys go back and finish. I just want to make sure that you, everybody has plenty of time to do quiz. And so I will be kind of moving through these to keep us going along and ensure that you have plenty of time for your quiz. The absolute value functions equation is the get the absolute value of x. So that's easy to remember. The absolute value function is given by f of x equals absolute value of x. And no matter what input right, goes in the absolute value function, the a positive, a positive, non-negative number right, is returned. So negative 2 returns 2. Negative 1 returns 1. 0, 0. 
three, three. If we can make the, continue making order pairs and connect to them, we get a picture that look like a V shape. And so if we continue choosing values, I get what I affectionately call an absolute value V. I remember an absolute value makes a V shaped graph. Important characteristics. It's V shaped. It has reflectional symmetry. domain is all real x's. However, the range you can see is restricted. Notice how the graph only appears in the top, the top half of our xy coordinate plane. Absolute value only returns positive values or zero in the special case that my input is zero. So the range <coughs> is the set of all y such that y is greater than or equal to zero. Now we're getting better with the break versus brackets. Go, go, gadget arm. Where are you in the back? Next up is the squaring function. The squaring function is named because its equation is f of x equals x squared. We can get <coughs> points on the squaring function by inputting x's and squaring them. So negative 2 quantity squared is 4. Negative 1, 1. 0, 0. 1, 1. 2, 4. And we saw a relative of the squaring function in last class when we made the y equals 1 half x squared. It was a u shape. Well, that's a relative of the parent function, f of x equals x squared. It's a parabola, we'll call it. And it makes a u shape, not a v shape. Let's go ahead and fill in my key points. Close behind me, though, please. One, one, two, four. We want to make a nice smooth U shape. A nice smooth U shape. There's no corners or kinks in this. And it's not a sharp turning point. In fact, it's a nice smooth bottom of a bowl. If you were to continue to zoom in, it would get a nice flat part of the bowl. Okay? It's not a corner or kink the way it is with that sort of time. We'll call this a parabola. Key characteristics. It's U-shaped. With reflect. Reflectional symmetry. Domain all real x's. And the range, again, is restricted. Only non negative outputs exist. And so the set of all y such that y is greater than or equal to 0. the square root function. The square root function looks like half of my squaring function. Which half? Well, we're going to see in a minute. We've only taken the positive root here. The positive root instead of doing the positive and negative square root when we're solving an equation. Then we'll see how our picture results. If I plug in input values that are negative, right? If I plug in input values that are negative, like negative 1, what happens? We get a negative inside of a square root, right? And that's not possible. That doesn't, well, that, that does not exist. That's undefined in the realm of real numbers. So we'll say, why is undefined? It does not exist. 
when x is any negative number. But as soon as we get to 0, then my function starts producing outputs. So the square root of 0 is 0, the square root of 1 is 1, the square root of 4 is 2, the square root of 9 is 3, and so on and so forth. We can connect those and see what this looks like. And we see that we get half of a problem, but arching to the side. Right? This is the square root function. It's one arm of my original parabola reflected about the line y equals x. The domain, right? The domain is only non-negative x values. What's that? What's a parabola? A parabola is just the name of the name of the squaring function. And so if somebody decided to name the parabola, right? Y equals y equals x squared. The squaring function is called a parabola. We'll see that a different function is called the hyperbola. Oh, I see. Right there, that second tile right underneath the outlet. You can take one of everything right underneath the um, plus. Yep. So, a parabola then is just a name for the squaring function, much like a hyperbola is the name for the graph of uh, the reciprocal function. And we're going to see that when we get to number seven. Okay, so somebody decided to name it that way. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at our domain and range, again, only non, only non-negative inputs will be allowed. So how will we say that? Easy cheesy. We'll say the set of all x such that x is greater than or equal to zero. And those are only paired with output values, y values, such that y is greater than or equal to zero. And that's my restricted domain and range. Important characteristics, <laughs> only non-negative inputs allowed. So only non-negative input x values are allowed because I can't have a negative inside of a square. <laughs> go, go, guys, John. A cubing function is named because it looks like f of x equals x cubed. It takes input values and cubes them before assigning them to an output. So f of x equals x cubed. You can get some key points by plugging in negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, and cubing those inputs. Negative 2 cubed, negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2 is negative 8. Negative 1 cubed. Negative 1, 0 cubed is 0, 1 cubed is 1, 2 cubed is 8. Plotting these points gives us the parent function for the cubing. Let's see, negative 1, negative 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and 2, 8. If I connect these in a nice smooth curve, We've got this serpentine graph that changes curvature right there, changes curvature at the origin. So we've got some new characteristics for this one. While the domain and range are both all reals, so domain all real x's, and the range all real y's, important characteristics for the first time we've got a graph with rotational symmetry. So this graph, I call snake-shaped. I call it snake-shaped. You can see it slithering there along your green sheet. Snake-shaped, and it has rotational symmetry, 180 degrees about the origin. Rotational symmetry. As opposed to the reflectional symmetry where we saw those left-right bilateral halves, now we have rotational symmetry. If you were to grab onto this arm, right, these arms, and spin it like a steering wheel, 180 degrees around the origin, it would fall upon its own image. Here we go. The reciprocal function now 
has another special name. Like Matab was asking about parabola, the reciprocal function's graph is called a hyperbola. Let's go ahead and get its equation. The reciprocal function is f of x equals 1 over x. The reciprocal function produce outputs by taking inputs and taking the reciprocal. And so if I were to plug in negative 2, it would be paired with the output 1 over negative 2 or negative 1. If I plugged in negative 1, that would be paired with 1 over negative 1 is negative 1. If I plugged in negative 1 half, it would be paired with its reciprocal. What's the reciprocal of negative 1 half? Negative 2 over 1. So negative 1 half is paired with negative 2. When I plug in 0, however, my function machine breaks. Why is that? Well, when plugging in 0, for x, I create a 0 in the bottom of fraction. And so guess what? My function f is undefined, does not exist when x equals 0. I'm going to go ahead and get some more x values quick before making our picture. So I'm going to go ahead and choose positive 1 half. It's paired with 2. Uh, positive 1, 1, and positive 4, 1 fourth. Let's go ahead and plot some of these together. Negative 2, comma, negative 1 half is right here. Negative 1, negative 1. Negative 1 half, negative 2. Undefined at x equals 0, so I can't plot a point there. 1 half, comma, 2. 1, 1. 4, 1 fourth. Guess what? 3 would be 1 third. 2 would be 1 half. And if I continue making these points, I'll see what I like to affectionately call swoops, where I've got this swoop in this third quadrant and a swoop here in the second quadrant. And for the first time now, we're seeing these features called asymptotes, right? Asymptotes. As x approaches 0, gets closer and closer to 0, my function values are shooting off the charts. You guys see that? They're shooting off the charts, either down towards negative infinity or up towards positive infinity. And that's what we call a vertical asymptote. So important characteristics, we've got a vertical asymptote. A vertical asymptote. He said, he said asymptote. Asymptote is spelled A S Y M P T O T E. And I wrote it on the sideboard here because we ran out of power. <laughs> First hour, I don't know if you guys were here. We had no power, so I went old school, whiteboard. Know what I'm saying? Asymptote. Vertical asymptote, this equation is x equals 0. And that's right here. Vertical asymptote goes down the y axis. We also have a horizontal asymptote. Asymptote has equation y equals 0, and it's here on the graph, along the x-axis. The domain of my, the domain of my reciprocal function is all real x values except for x equals 0. When I plug in x equals 0, broke the function rule, right? Blew up the math rules. The function was undefined. So my domain is set of all x's <coughs> such that x doesn't equal 0. The range ends up being the set of all y values except for right y equals y equals 0. y will never equal 0 because the only way for a fraction to equal 0 is if the numerator equals 0. And this numerator is set to be 1 constant value. So that no matter what I choose for x, it will never equal 0. So y cannot equal 0. One last thing I'd like to add for our important characteristics. Again, rotational symmetry. Look at that. If you spun it 180 degrees about the origin, it would fall upon its own image. So rotational symmetry is the final important characteristic I'd like to include today. Don't worry, Ethan will be able to say it one more time. We still got one more graph, I'm hopeful. <laughs> if I try hard, I can work out saying asymptote again in class. 
right? It'll be write down asymptote, and I could help you spell asymptote. I could even label the name of the equation for the asymptote, each asymptote. Let's see how that works. So the inverse squaring function is given by 1 over x squared. 1 over x squared is the inverse squaring function. And values are assigned, output values are assigned by taking inputs and taking the reciprocal of their square. That's why it's called the inverse squaring function. Let's see some points on this. So I'm going to choose um, negative 1 half. I'm going to take negative 1 half. And square it, I get positive 1 fourth. And then the reciprocal of positive 1 fourth would be positive 4 over 1. So negative 1 half is paired with 4. When I plug in negative 1, when I plug in negative 1, squared is positive 1, and 1 over 1 is 1. When I plug in negative 2, I get negative 2 squared is 4. I get 1 over 4 is 1 fourth. When I plug in 0, I get error, 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 does not exist, undefined. How come? Create a 0 on the bottom of the fraction. So at x equals 0, the function is undefined. I can do the same thing by choosing positive values. Now, if I chose a positive 1 half, when I square it, I'll still get positive 1 fourth, and the reciprocal of 1 fourth is 4. And so guess what? Plus and minus x equals 1 half return 4. Plus and minus 1 both return 1. Plus and minus 2 both return 1 fourth, and so on and so forth. Let's see what this looks like. So negative one half comma four one half comma four negative one one positive one one negative two one fourth positive two one fourth zero undefined if i carefully connected these coordinates i'd get something a little like an old school atari symbol Atari was an old gaming platform back when I was a kid. Before they had Xbox Live and Xbox 360 and Wii and PS3. And COD, Modern Warfare, and Halo 3. There was this gaming console called Atari and it had a logo that looked kind of like this. Alright, so this is our our inverse squaring function. Ethan, we have a vertical asymptote here at x equals 0. That's an important characteristic. At x equals 0. And a horizontal asymptote. A horizontal asymptote. except x can equal 0. So the set of all x such that x doesn't equal 0. And the range would be only, only positive y values are produced. And so the set of all y such that y is strictly greater than 0. And I'll go go gadget arm so you can see a little bit better. Does this graph have rotational symmetry, like the reciprocal function? Rotational symmetry? <coughs> no, this has reflectional symmetry again. Reflectional symmetry, left, right. Take a minute and make sure you have your green sheet completed. Right? We'll be referring to this the rest of the unit. At this time, I'd ask that you go ahead and take everything off your desk except for a pencil, a pencil, and a calculator if you choose to use one. Remember, you can't use pens on tests or quizzes, so now would be a great time to ask a classmate to borrow a pencil if you don't have one.
binders off and away, pencil pouches off and away. You can have a pencil, erase the calculator, but that's it. Your homework is, is the linear functions activity worksheet. That's it. You already picked it up from the roller cart. Does not include any book work and no reading questions. So you have a nice little break over the over the weekend. You still have a very important assignment, but it's not that long. You may use the table feature in your calculator to help you with the tables, but you can also evaluate by hand. The choice is yours. After everybody's got stuff off their desk, then we'll go ahead and get started. A reminder when you're done with your quiz, then you can work on the linear uh, functions activity worksheet. I would ask that you don't talk for a minute of class time. Even if everybody finishes, please don't talk. I will try to grade your quizzes so I can get them into the campus there uh, coming up on Monday. And then we will talk about this. Uh, as a summary to begin our discussion on on Tuesday. Okay, awesome. So at this time, I'll ask that 